Greetings, fellow soldiers, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriating the Culture. On today's episode, we talk about the death of meritocracy, the cultural contributors to that death, and the biblical understanding of merit. So grab your number two pencil, fill out that standardized test, be the team captain, pick the dodgeball cannon fodder last, and let's earn ourselves a merit badge. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your scout leader today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> You might have noticed that our culture, particularly in education, is increasingly reluctant to reward or acknowledge excellence. New York City recently did away with its gifted and talented school program due to allegations of segregation and that they segregated gifted students from the pace eaters. Standardized tests as well are being phased out for the simple reason that if we all took the same tests, some people would perform better than others. Standardized tests are bad precisely because they contain standards. But at least we'll still have the grading system for at least some metric of academic excellence. Oh wait, nope, those are gone too. Now part of the reason for this broad cultural push to eliminate merit goes back to our discussion on equity, which we address on episode 22. The view of many in our culture is that all failures are attributable to oppression and all success is merely benefiting from that oppression. Therefore, all disparate outcomes are due to a sort of mistreatment and systemic injustice. And the easiest way to ensure that there are no unequal outcomes is to have no outcomes at all. No tests, no grades, and no possible reward for merit, which means all of us are equal. And that's quite sad and pathetic, but we didn't get here overnight. And what I want us to see today is how culturally we got to the death of meritocracy. I think it began, as so many things did, back in the 1990s. Nothing happened. Okay, well, to put you in the right frame of mind, here's a picture of me circa 1992-ish. I'm on a horse. Look at those hammer pants. Got the pump-up sneakers. Sweet fashion aside, why do I attribute that decade to the death of meritocracy? Because on May 22, 1992, a day that will live in infamy, MTV released an original reality television show called The Real World. Now, that wasn't the first reality program. For instance, PBS back in 1973 released a docu-series on an average American family called An American Family, aptly named. But the real world is in many ways the progenitor of modern reality television. It spawns not only spinoffs like Road Rules and The Challenge, but its low-cost, high-ratings format spewed forth a reality program craze that rose through the 90s, peaked in the early aughts, and endures to this day. Everything from Teen Mom to Jersey Shore to The Real Housewives to Keeping Up with the Kardashians can trace their roots to the real world, which was a sort of poison pill that killed meritocracy because it instilled in a generation the notion that you could be rich and famous while having no discernible skill, ability, or redeemable qualities. See, it used to be the case in our culture that celebrities were famous because of their ability. They were successful entrepreneurs or important politicians or were gifted athletes or they were good singers, or good dancers, or good actors, or good comedians, or at the very least, they were exceptionally good looking. There was at least some merit attached to their success. But can you honestly tell me why Snooki is worth $5 million? See, reality TV birthed the celebrity without ability, a new class of celebrity that was famous for being famous. Dancing like Fred Astaire, acting like Tom Hardy, kicking like Justin Tucker, riding like Aaron Sorkin, having smarts like Stephen Hawking, or being really, really ridiculously good-looking like Ben Stiller might be a big ask, but I could be famous for being famous. Do I have to sing? No. Do I have to dance? No. Do I have to act? No. Do I have to have any artistic talent in any way, shape, or form? No. Do I have to be funny? No. Do I have to be smart? No. Do I have to be an expert on any subject at all? No. Do I have to sink a three-pointer? No. Do I have to throw a fastball? No. Do I have to be athletic in any way, shape, or form? No. Okay. I could probably do that. So is it any wonder that things like socialism and the obsession with equity are on the rise in our society? For decades now, our culture has been promulgating example after example of riches, wealth, and celebrity independent of merit. Success looks more like dumb luck, emphasis on dumb, than it does excellence. 
And that has only been exasperated by the internet. Surveys show that 75% of kids want to be YouTube stars or vloggers, which is really the modern manifestation of the reality star. It might be tricky to make the NBA, you might need some, you know, talent, but you could point a camera at yourself and watch movies. That seems doable. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh. Some sort of save our bloops type thing. Riveting. Or maybe you're more of a producer. Here's a channel that's just movie clips from comic book films. Yep, that's it. That's the whole channel. Just posted clips from comic book movies. 8.23 million subscribers. For reference, we have 235 total. But maybe grabbing clips from movies is too much work. No worries. Do you have a camera and opposable thumbs? Well, then you can be an unboxer. Here's an unboxing video in its entirety, only sped up. That channel has 2.49 million subscribers. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to us by our new format. Is this what you want? Like and subscribe, guys. Alrighty, so we all very much deserve help which is actually a good place to start when we're talking merit. It says in Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our salvation is not merit-based. It's not our excellence or our worth, and it's not what we do that earns our salvation. It is purely a gift from God. However, as we said when talking about equity, we will still be judged based on what we do in response to our salvific calling. It says in Corinthians, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. And, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. God does reward excellence, and the celebration of excellence is wholly proper and even demanded when it is celebrated in connection to our Creator. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and the excellence that we exhibit reflects our Creator, which demands our praise. It's good to see the display of the human body in athletics, or to behold excellence in dance, in song, in art, in creation, or to marvel at the staggering mental capability of the human mind, the things that we can create, the things that we can do, the things that we've accomplished. God gives us talents and abilities and gifts, and He wants us to use them well and praise Him by using them well. And it finds perfect expression within the church. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should be have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. See, Christianity is the answer to these things. If we're all about merit, that would just leave us discouraged and in complete and total despair. 
but we are loved and accepted and belong because of grace. We have salvation as a pure gift based on nothing that we did. And yet, we also don't need to deny what we're good at. We can have standardized tests and get picked last in dodgeball without being embittered or jealous because our identity is ultimately in Christ. He has made us how we are, to be excellent in the way we are. And so those differences and distinctions are joyous and not jealous when expressed through the body of Christ. It's a meritocracy in unity, which exists nowhere else in the world but in the church. Well, that's it for today. Uh, like and subscribe to my unboxing channel. Uh, hit me up on the major socials with any questions or comments. And I'll see you next week for more Appropriating the Culture. <laughs>